Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is a new plenary session edition. This is plenary session round table. This is the new plenary session. We've got uh, a quite a, a show in store for you today. We've got a bunch of experts in multiple myeloma, and I'm going to take you through who they are and where they're from. And we're going to talk about some of the hottest topics in myeloma. Strictly speaking, it's not a debate. It's a round table. Everyone can defend their own position. Positions may vary because of, I think, uh, the varied and interesting evidence base of multiple myeloma. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, without any further ado, let me introduce them. We've got, uh, I'm going to go in my screen. I don't know what it's actually going to look like when we put the recording out, but on my screen, I've got Raj Chakraborty. Uh, Raj yeah. is an assistant professor at Columbia University. He came from the Cleveland Clinic program. He is a budding myeloma expert, um, and he attends on multiple myeloma service, CAR-T, allotransplant, autotransplant. Raj, thank you so much for doing this show. Thank you, Vinay. I've got Sam Rubenstein from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, also an assistant professor of medicine. He is a myeloma expert um, and, uh, and he's gonna be giving us his two cents. Thank you so much, Sam, for doing this. Thank you for having me. I've got friend of the show, Mani Moyudin. Mani's been here before a couple of times to talk about some papers we've been working on. Mani is a uh, almost to be assistant professor at uh, the University of Utah. Uh, and uh, Mani, it's a pleasure to see you again. Mani promises to make myeloma great again. That's his slogan. He's got the red hats in his trunk. Uh, we've got Ben Derman. Ben Derman, assistant professor at the University of Chicago, my alma mater. Um, he is a graduate of the University of Chicago Fellowship, and, uh, and he is a myeloma expert as well. So we've got four card-carrying myeloma experts. And I guess me, if you consider me a myeloma expert, I do see a sizable chunk of myeloma in my practice at the general here. Um, and then we've got Kevin Knopf. Uh, Kevin Knopf is chairman of medical oncology and hematology at Highland Hospital. He's uh, a master of all. Uh, he sees everything in his practice, including multiple myeloma. Kevin, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. We got four assistant professors. We got a chairman. <clears throat> we, got quite, we got quite a round table here. I, I can promise you here that... Um, that five of us are, are being exploited by our employer and underpaid, but the one of us might be treated correctly. One of us might be treated correctly, but the assistant professors, the assistant professors, no love for, no love for us in this line of work. Okay, let me kick it off with a very, uh, you know, we're gonna try, I'm gonna try to cover a lot of ground. Um, first line therapy, high risk myeloma, maintenance, auto transplant. Um, and I guess the goal of this is just to get different perspectives. And so, I mean, why don't we just start off? Um, <laughs> You know, you've got a newly diagnosed patient with multiple myeloma in your office. Um, let's say they're 65. Let's say they look really good. Um, uh, we'll start with you, Raj. So, you know, what information do you like to know? And, and how do you think about your initial treatments? Like, how do you like to treat such a patient? Yeah, so uh, if I have a newly diagnosed patient at 65, you know, most of, most of the time they would be transplant eligible, you know, at uh, 65 years old. So uh, the most important thing I would like to know is uh, the fish cytogenetics and whether they are standard risk or high risk. And by high risk, I mean uh, T4, 14, 14, 16, deletion 17P, and uh, definitely amplification 1Q21. Uh, gain 1Q21 is kind of in the, in the gray zone. So, you know, there is still a lot of debate about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, definitely am 1Q21. So these are, you know, these are the things that I look at. And then some other things like do they have real extramedullary disease, like not para osseous, but like extra osseous extramedullary disease? Uh, do they have circulating plasma cells? If, even if it doesn't meet the criteria for plasma cell leukemia, mm. uh, especially on morphology, if I see any circulating plasma cells. So these patients you know, are high risk and assuming that they are transplant eligible. In high risk patients, I do prefer uh, giving them quadruplet, either DARA VRD or DARA KRD. <laughs> Uh huh. Okay. Uh, okay. So, yeah. so you say you got a 414 patient. Uh, let's uh, say they're uh, 60 percent plasma cells on the marrow. Uh, let's say free light chain ratio is 110. Uh, good performance status. You're thinking a, a Dara a quadruplet. So Dara VRD, Dara Carity. What are you going to give them? So if they are young, have no comorbidities, uh, you know, especially no cardiac or renal comorbidities, then. I would, you know, consider giving Dara KRD. On the other hand, you know, if I even if I have a little bit of a doubt that whether they may have some toxicity, the problem is we don't have good predictors for cartilaginous cardiotoxicity. So even if I have a little bit of a doubt clinically, I would give them Dara VRD because I am not convinced that those are, you know, that different. Of course, there is no randomized trial comparing them, uh, but then I would do Dara VRD. So most of the time, actually, when I use a quadruplet, I would say 90% of the time I use Dara VRD. And your standard risk patients, what do you give them? Uh, standard is I give them VRD uh, if okay. they're transplant eligible. Okay. And, okay. Uh, if they're transplant ineligible, then that's a different, you know. So, uh, 
Okay, that that I think is defensible. And if somebody asks you for a reference for the Derek Carradine, you're going to cite which randomized, which uh, which which phase two study you're going to cite. So for Dara Kiyadi, you mean? Yeah. Uh, so for Dara Kiyadi, you know, there are two, like the Manhattan trial, which was recently published, and, master, <laughs> and the master trial. Yes. Uh, however, you know, I don't use Dara Kiyadi that much. I mostly use okay. Dara Kiyadi. Oh, so Dara Kiyadi. Dara Kiyadi. And for yeah, I think we have now the phase two Griffin trial, and then also you know, the Cassiopeia trial, which is Dara VTD. But, you know, it did show that uh, in Cassiopeia trial, there was almost a 20% higher MRD negativity in high-risk patients as well. And it was okay. a large trial, so that's fine. Wow. All right, Sam, how about you? Same question, same two people in your office, standard risk, um, uh, myeloma. I guess one question is, you know, do you check all those cytogenetics routinely? And uh, of course you do, you're a myeloma expert. Uh, you got to, they got, they got to pay you for something. And then, and then what are you going to do in your standard risk, your high risk patient? Let's say 414, let's pick an easy one, not too controversial. I would actually say of those, 414 is the toughest one. Because, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, we'll maybe get to that. But yeah, okay. so I'll start off by saying I define high risk myeloma the same way Raj does. Uh, so deletion 17P, uh, 414, 1416 translocations, or amplification uh, 1Q, meaning more than three copies. Um, uh, I manage uh, transplant eligible uh, line patients with high risk myeloma with KRD. Um, and the phase two trial that I use to support that is uh, the, the, which is actually not all the way fully published is Forte. Um, uh, there's others Benji will tell you about that his center has been involved in. Um, standard risk myeloma, uh, transplant eligible, I manage with uh, RVD. Okay, um, RD, RVD, yep. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if you have follow-up for me on that, but that's- No, I, I, guess, I guess I'd say, I mean, uh, the standard risk myeloma, everyone will know, it's uh, the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, or it's, a, it, yeah, it's an ECOG study led by uh, uh, Shaji. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think that the, the debate part will, or the part where people will see where people have different uh, points of view will be the high risk. So how about we'll go to you, Ben, and then we'll circle back. So Ben, what do you, what, what are your thoughts here? Frontline setting? Yeah. You know what? I, I actually think we don't really know. I mean, we're, we're <laughs> okay. presuming like, like this is, uh, this is, this is somehow known, but this is all opinion. Right. And, and the other thing is, you know, the, the regimens that, that Raj listed, they all sound great to me, but uh, does insurance actually cover that? I mean, you know, uh, I, I just warned those who are listening that um, it's, it's really going to depend on, in part on what insurance is going to cover. I have noticed that um, DARA VRD, for instance, um, you know, does uh, happen to be covered at, at higher rates. Now, for me, I actually um, <coughs> fighting for high risk patients between um, if I'm not, you know, enrolling on a clinical trial, which I would say would be my first uh, option. But aside from that, um, DARA VRD or KRD. Um, you know, I, I think basically it's anything but VRD for the high risk patient for me. Um, and, you know, we've, we've uh, mentioned, um, you know, there are VTD in the Cassiopeia study, the Griffin study. I'll acknowledge that when you look at the high risk subsets in these trials, there's only about 15% of these patients who are high risk. And, you know, it's not powered to really show a difference. So, you know, there's the risk for type one or type two error in these cases. And so, we don't really know um, what's the right way um, to, to treat a high risk patient. And you'll find a lot of variation over time. And then um, for standard risk, for different people. Yeah, go I ahead. Well put. Yeah, and for standard risk, you're also with everyone VRD. Well, actually, I mean, why not Dara VRD? That, Let okay. me say that. Because if you actually look at the data, I mean, we, we take like, oh, Dara VRD is showing this, um, you know, yes. showing this benefit yes. in MRD negativity, but most of the benefit is in standard risk patients because that's those are the people who are enrolled in the study. So why not Dara VRD for these patients? I'm just bringing it up as a no. I think it's it, 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 yeah. We can come to that. I think that that's a fair. But what do you actually do in your practice? What are you up to? Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm actually choosing between VRD and Dara yeah. VRD. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say it's um, necessarily arbitrary. I don't think DARA adds a lot of, of toxicity. So for most patients, I am using DARA VRD. Um, the DARA goes down easy. That's true. There's no doubt about that. It goes down easy. Okay, Mani. Mani, you're going to push back on these people, huh? High-risk myeloma. What are you doing, Mani? What are you doing? Right. So, I mean, I agree with the definitions. and yes. uh, But I think that, you know, from a, from a philosophical standpoint for these high-risk patients, it's, you know, they respond they do respond to these treatments. I think the problem is maintaining the response. Their responses are short-lived, right? That's that's generally been the problem with high risk throughout the literature. If you look, this it's maintaining the response that's the problem. And we know that BRD followed by transparent, followed by LEN maintenance 
you don't get really good outcomes with these patients. And I acknowledge that. But what we don't know is whether any of these alternate ex- approaches really lead to better long-term outcomes for these patients. When you acknowledge, when you acknowledge subsequent therapies, when you acknowledge sequencing, uh, when you acknowledge the limitations of MRD as we know it today, um, how MRD is prognostic for sure, but it's not necessarily a, an established surrogate yet. So it's, it, it is a tough decision and I, and I get, and I, and I also have this urge where I want to do something better than just PRD um, for my patients, but at least the approach that I have um, at, when I, when I see patients with KU is that for, for fit eligible patients, we do VRD and then we do transplant. And then on the maintenance side of things, we are more aggressive because as it, as I mentioned earlier, that's common, that's common. You yeah. To, you want to maintain a response for as long as possible because getting a response is, you know, they do get a response. And we, when we talk more about that, uh, hopefully today, but yeah, the approach for maintenance is different. I just don't think that we have, solid data yet that, you know, better or that adding more upfront triplets versus cord really like impacts long-term survival. You I don't, recognize- you don't dispute that you'll push them deeper. You'll get more MRD, you'll get more response. Uh, your question is whether or not that will translate when you factor <clears> in <throat> that you could, you know, there are other ways you can deepen response if you're not yeah, getting where you want to be before translating. Yeah. Duration of response. Okay. And then when you factor in sequencing down the road, whether it actually will lead to improve longevity and survival. I do okay. agree you're likely to get a you know deeper response up front but you know here's there's a tough question for you and, and, yeah. and, and accounting for sequencing and having other options available um and here's also a, yeah. like health economics and stuff i know that you know you want to do the best for the patient in front of you who are you nice do we invite nice to this party <laughs> i'm just saying we do i mean i i, I struggle with all of these things yeah. and i think that's why the it, it's not crystal clear and that's why like i think brd is still not a wrong answer for these patients. Okay, follow-up um, question to you. If that is the case, if that is the case, do you even need to send your fish? Why do you need the cytogenetics for initially? So that's, that's a great question. So, I mean, they're, a they're great question. very important from a prognostic standpoint. They're uh-huh. undeniably important from a prognostic sure. standpoint. Sure. And because you have these patients like, so for example, I had a patient with like plasma cell leukemia who came in and who had this expectation that her life expectancy was going to be like 10 plus years. And but like, she has so, plasma cell leukemia. You don't need no cytogenetics I, I, to answer that question, do you? <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, you, uh-huh. between, you know, the layperson, like, they, they think that oh, all myeloma, you're expected to live 10 years. And that is not true. Myeloma is an incredibly heterogeneous disease. I think, Correct. you know, I think we classify several different diseases as multiple myeloma. I think Correct. some of them are incredibly heterogeneous. Correct. And probably ought to be classified as different diseases. And we wouldn't know a lot of that without cytogenetics. I'm not saying cytogenetics is perfect. Cytogenetics it's not, is right, of course, yeah. Iceberg. There are a lot more differences that are out there that we are trying to do a better job of discovering, but you wouldn't know that. I think it's it's very- So final final answer, you do, you do it for prognostic purposes, even if it doesn't change your treatment, you don't use it predictively. That's correct. And it, okay. and it does change treatment down the road. Like it, Of course, it, but it, yeah. It changes my maintenance treatment. It changes how aggressively I push for transplant in, in certain situations if they're borderline candidates or you know they're, they're not fully convinced about the, the, the transplant process. But you're right. The first induction treatment, it may not necessarily impact it at some institutions, but I think it is still the standard of care. And I think there's reasonable evidence that it it, it's good information to have. Okay. Okay. Let's go to you, Kevin. Arnie, Kevin, you're. He did, he did also about. say it impacts his maintenance strategy. That's too. true. That's true. <laughs> and fair. yeah, I mean, I, I think so. That, that that's where he's going to let it fi- fi- um, affect his therapy. I agree with you. So so that would be the rationale. Uh, I I can imagine there's somebody, maybe some theoretical person, maybe it'll be Kevin, who will defend the proposition VRD, and they all get the same maintenance irrespective of cytogenetics. Let's see if Kevin. Kevin, okay, you work in Highland Hospital. Highland right. Hospital. This isn't this isn't the Upper West Side. This isn't uh uh. The, the hallowed halls of University of Chicago. I just toured your new hospital, my friend. Uh, that Sky Deck Observatory uh, blew me away. I mean, they didn't have that when I was there. We just had the old fashioned Mitchell Hospital. It wasn't, wasn't too pretty. Kevin's there. He's in a county hospital. It's in Oakland, California. Kevin, what are you, what, so maybe you're thinking about it differently. Uh, what, what, how do you think about the initial therapy myeloma? Are you sending cytogenetics on everybody? Um, do you know it? And does it affect your treatment? What do you do? Um, you know, I want to preface this. I, I was in private practice in Annapolis for a while, and I was in private practice in San Francisco for a while in Pacific Heights. Oh. Uh, and I, I came here three yeah. years ago, which is the county hospital in Oakland. It's actually three hospitals. And I would say that the way I treated patients didn't, has never changed. My style 
my practice style. The only difference is that when I was in the private sector, it was a lot more discussion with the patient to explain to them what lead time bias was, what overdiagnosis was, why I didn't agree with what they found on the internet. So newly diagnosed myeloma, I don't send cytogenetics. I don't send all that stuff. I wanna know sort of what it looks like histologically. And then I wanna know what tumor marker to follow. So I send that. Um, and when I send my patients for transplant, they always are like shocked that they don't have that information. But um, I will say that I, I'm sure I'm the oldest person on this podcast. <laughs> so I, I finished oncology in the 20th century where <laughs> we needed to have uh-huh. outcomes of overall survival. We didn't use progression-free survival or disease-free survival. And so my head is still that way. I have not embraced surrogate endpoints at all. Um, and also I spent some time at, at Hopkins and there's a saying of the the Oslo Marines at Hopkins, that you don't order a test unless it's going to change your management. So I don't order things that are prognostic because it won't really affect that one patient. You know, it's just sort of information and it comes at a cost. And, and my philosophy is to try and minimize the cost that we spend on patients in order to, to optimize the outcome. So Okay, so um, you're VR, VRD for everybody. I do VRD. I could see the temptation to use DARA VRD or DARA KRD. My criterion is not whether the insurance company allows it or not, yeah. it's whether it improves overall survival in a randomized control trial. Okay, gentlemen, let me, let me ask you guys this question because this, this is my philosophical question. Let's say hypothetically you're in a hospital and uh, they, they're not going to give it to you. They're not going to give you the cytogenetic information. So you just see the 65-year-old coming in. You know what percent of the marrow, you know it's IgG uh, lambda or you know, you know it's IgA or IgD perhaps. You know, you'll know that information. Um, let's, say, let's say you're in such a hospital and let's say you follow Kevin's approach and you know, your VRD initially, you get a couple cycles in, you check where people are, maybe you refer them for, uh, for transplant. And then they say, you know, let's do a marrow on this guy. He's got four cycles in, six cycles. They marrow him. He's not quite where they want to be. Uh, maybe they say, try KCD, try switching him to something deep in that response. So before we collect him, or, you know, maybe they'll say that. Maybe they'll say, um, you know, press on. Uh, uh, sometimes they'll say, collect him anyway. They'll, they'll, they'll sci mobilize him or something like that. Uh, I mean, they're different people, have different views. I guess my question is this. Would you say, I mean, do you, I mean, is, is it a, um, would you say that approach would be wrong? Uh, that like you could try VRD initially, see how they respond and then go from there and intensify if you need to, if you want to get them to transplant. Any thoughts on this? If I could interject, yes, I mean, I please. think that, um, well, you're talking a little bit about not necessarily primary refractory disease, although that's part of it, right? People yes. who progress with, with, during induction, that's a very bad sign. That's terrible. Regardless. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, but suboptimal response. Suboptimal responses. Yeah. I mean, your plateaus, we see that all the time. Um, you know, my general approach is if they get to a point where they have less, maybe less than 10% plasma cells in the bone marrow, I feel comfortable about doing stem cell collection. Me too, yeah. Um, if not, I try to deepen their response a little bit more. But when we're talking about high-risk myeloma in general, I think it's a, it's a bucket term ultimately for patients who we predict based on, you know, the data that we have that, you know, are going to progress probably within two or three years, right? That I think would be an early relapse um, with the first line of therapy. So you're not necessarily going to know if, you know, early on, if that patient is high risk or not. In fact, there's actually some evidence that suggests that patients who respond before three months as their best response do worse, do worse. So why is that, right? We all feel good when a patient's having this awesome response to therapy. Maybe they even get into a CR before transplant, but ultimately what's going to determine their, you know, is just time and to see what happens after transplant. So, you know, um, it's about finishing the job after transplant to me um, for for high-risk patients. I agree. So, uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's well articulated. I guess my, my question is, let's say you've got Kevin's philosophy. Um, would you, uh, uh, he's looking at something but else. What's the cost of the fish? I, I, I mean, no, I'm no, I'm, not, no I, I'm, I'm just doing it as a thought yeah, exercise. I mean, it's no, not, of course. It's not like, uh, it's, no, it's, it's trivial that. cost. I mean, it's like what, uh, 15 minutes of uh, Dara time. <laughs> no, I was going to say it's like three days of revel minute. Three month. days of revel. <laughs> it is. No, it's trivial. I do it as a thought experiment because what I'm trying to get at is, um, you know, whether or not you, I mean, I guess I'm trying to think of, I mean, it's a thought experiment in my mind because one, um, uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm doing a poor job of articulating it, but um, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is you're going to give a lot more therapy earlier for your high risk people, at least the three of you on the left side of my screen will than the two on the right side of my screen. And I guess when you're going to take them to transplant anyway, um, 
you know, what, um, you know, and, and you have, you know, salvage lines. I mean, do you think that this upfront treatment is going to, I don't know, improve their overall longevity, or do you think it's just going to delay their first progression? Um, you know, we'll get to the maintenance in a second, but I mean, what is, what do you think you're, what do you think that Kevin is not accomplishing that you're accomplishing? You think a higher fraction are going to get transplanted? No. I think one thing, uh, probably, no, not because of that. I think the main reason is that in high risk patients, although we know we'll probably talk about MRD at some point. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so uh, we know, you know, we still don't have trial level, level surrogacy for MRD in myeloma. We're still waiting for the results of That's the ice trial. But, you know, we, I don't think we can ignore the data from the Spanish group, which shows that patients who have sustained MRD negativity, there is two MRD negative at you know, 12 months apart, for example, they have almost flat PFS uh, and OS yeah. curves, even if they are high risk. So I think, you know, like we know that if we give them a quadruplet upfront transplant and dual maintenance, you know, th that will give them the highest odds of achieving that. So at least with the best available evidence, that's my rationale for using quadruplet upfront. And I agree, can I agree. experts uh, answer something for me though about MRD and things like that? Because when I look at it, it seems like confounding by indication and lead time bias. In other words, MRD means the patients who have a better response have a better response. And I don't see why intensification to get to a better MRD. Is yeah, better. so I guess I want to separate the two things. So, I mean, yeah. there are people who get to MRD negativity. They do really well. Yes. What trial level surrogacy asks is you're going to increase that and you're going to add maybe a few percentage more that achieve MRD negativity. Do those people who flip, who otherwise wouldn't have been MRD negative, who are now MRD negative, do they achieve as good an outcome as a person who got to MRD negativity quick and easy? And I think that's the open question as I see it. Yeah. So I think Tim, we you want to say go. Yeah, we don't yet have the, those data, as Raj pointed out, the I2 team study or I squared team study, however you want to say it, is still ongoing. Uh, there have been some meta-analyses that attempt to answer this question, but really what they do is establish the prognostic value of MRD, which is well established by better studies. Um, so money, uh, the goal, especially for high-risk patients, is sustaining a very deep remission. And I think, I think one piece of relatively recently disseminated evidence that might get it, Kevin's question, is the uh, uh, most recent update from the Forte trial, uh, which did show that regardless, so that's so just background for those who may yes. not be familiar. So that study randomized one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, three-way randomization, KRD times 12, KRD early auto, um, followed by KR, KRD consolidation, and then uh, KCD auto, yeah. uh, KCD consolidation. And then there's a second randomization to either R or KR maintenance. Um, and so and, but one thing I'll point out is a phase two. I mean, the sample size is what per arm? It's like 80? Uh, I have it actually. No, no. Uh, it's, it's 150, much higher than that. 150 per 150 arm. 150 per arm. Okay. But yeah. phase two. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what that study showed, so to your point, the patients who achieved MRD negativity at one time point, they still have stratification in their long-term outcomes, PFS, OS, what have you, depending on what therapeutic arm uh, they're randomized to. And those are similar to the MRD agnostic uh, survival curves. When you look at patients who achieve a sustained MRD negative remission over a period of at least a year, then what you start to see is very similar outcomes despite uh, what, what arm the patients achieved. So to me, I'm not yet using that routinely uh, to like make a treatment decision, but you may miss an opportunity to achieve a sustained deep remission by not um, you know, escalating these patients' therapy. And I, I do think it's probably the case that that will correlate with, with better outcomes. I mean, we're, we're, none of us knows the Benji's know. the point. But well, that's mean, why it's fun. It's fun, yeah. I mean, these Let's patients live a long time now, which is great, which means that if we're gonna be designing trials that are looking at OS as the primary endpoint, we're gonna be waiting forever. Uh, and we, we're not, we're gonna be missing potentially opportunities to improve. Actually, it's a, I mean, that's an interesting question to me, actually, uh, I guess. Um... I guess are there any are there are there any frontline randomized I don't think there are any frontline randomized studies that only include uh, high risk biocytogenetics. No, you there is one study. There was the Which Swag um, well, Swag study that compared ELO RVD versus RVD or VRD. With oh, RVD. that's right. This is yeah. um, this is um, 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 what's twelve eleven. Uh, Usmani was Usmani the Sad Usmani study. Yeah, yeah Sad study. Yeah, yeah. It was published. Fellow Carolinian. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. The other Carolinas, though the Carolinas. The other Carolina, yeah. Go yes. on, go on. Sorry, Ben. Finish your thought. Yes. No, no. Well, I mean, it, it, there was no difference seen between the two groups. Um, this, this did not uh, employ transplant as part of the regimen. Sure. Um, but that's really the that's really the only uh, enrichment trial for high risk patients that's that true. has yet that has been reported. That's um, my mind. Elo. 
Elo is not a great drug. Though. Probably the best drug. No, I was gonna. Let's, let's, let's Elo sell an extra. We're gonna put you on the back shelf for now. We're back shelf for now. And as uh, someone told me about Belantamab, the the good news about Belantamab's eye toxicity is that usually it stops working before the eye toxicity gets really bad. And that's what somebody told me. I I didn't like that. Okay, now let's do the um um. Okay, we're gonna do the uh, our time. I mean, our time is going quickly. Um, let's do the maintenance question. Uh, I actually think you know you guys are you guys are have, have articulated it very well. I think your your case, uh, and uh, maybe I'll give Monty a chance. I don't know. Maybe I'll give Monty a chance to respond before them to the maintenance. Monty, I don't know. You've heard these arguments. What are your? I mean, what would you what would you say? Um, in response, do you have anything to say for yourself, Monty? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm dealing with people that are more senior than me, and I look up to them by when, one year. By one. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I, I like a man. Punctuated equilibrium. I like someone who happens. still has respect. You know. I, I do try to be respectful. It's just my culture. Yeah. No. One year of attending hood has aged me greatly, yeah. though. So <laughs> you've, le- you've learned some dichotomizing yeah. a continuous endpoint, right? Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. One so, year. I mean, Yes, the first year of attending is a stressful year. You know, I actually think I think it takes. I don't. Well, I'll tell you something in a second. Okay, go finish your thought, Money. Finish your thought. No, I do think so. I will agree that the data for four day trial, the recently updated data, it is compelling. Um, you know, the, the KR versus R, but I will. I, you know, anytime I see PFS <laughs> data for maintenance, I always take a step back because the point of maintenance treatment, in general, historically and at least philosophically, for me, what it should be is that it should change the overall trajectory of your disease and it should change your overall survival. So, you know, KR maintenance should be better than, you know, giving just R maintenance and then adding Kyprolis with your next line of treatment. And I understand that it's going to take time for us to get those kind of answers. And sometimes we don't have the luxury of time when we have a patient with high risk thyrogenetics sitting in front of us, who we know is not going to do really well with R maintenance. So I struggle with that. Um, so, and, and I get, and you know, I'm on the same boat and that's part of why with maintenance, I'm, I still lean towards doublet maintenance, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, but I just think that philosophically and for a community as a whole, I do think that for adjuvant, for any adjuvant therapy, the bar has to be higher than just delaying your next treatment. And by um, adjuvant here, you're talking about continuous therapy. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, for maintenance so, or whatever, you, whatever term you want to use, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sam, what I are think- you saying? No, I think that's very well said. And you're right that we need to be mindful of the possibility that all we're doing is delaying relapse and, and inducing a more resistant phenotype when that happens. I think it's for me, the reason, so, and I struggle with the same thing, even though I come, I personally come down a little differently in terms of how I approach this. Um, I think the question is, there's, there's some degree of surrogate, of surrogate endpoint improvement that to me moves my prior uh, on whether a treatment's likely to improve OS. Um, and so w- given that we're going to struggle a- at um, showing OS advantages in these trials, I think, you know, we have to establish what that is. So like, um, you know, PFS is a relatively well-validated surrogate in frontline myeloma. There have been studies showing that, you know, uh, 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 interventional arms that prolong PFS um, uh, over control arms do tend to result in improved OS. Um, so, you know, uh, hazard ratios 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7, that's to me a meaningful benefit. So if I see that uh, improvement in PFS, I think it's pretty likely that uh, an arm is going to improve a patient's OS and I, I feel okay adopting it. I think Can it's, I a, question of degree. it's a question of degree. Uh-huh. I'm going to take a different tact on yes. this just to okay. add while we're talking about it. Yes. It seems like we've moved into, into talking about maintenance. Uh, yeah. um, okay. Uh, so I, I'm going to make an argument for why I think PFS does matter, at least PFS1. Uh, I believe that there are patients who have myeloma that do achieve operational cures. What do I mean by that? I mean people who eventually can come off of treatment, have absence of disease, we can define, we can talk about how sure. you want to define sure. that and uh, have had enough time surpass or have <laughs> enough time passed to really be able to determine that. If you look at the IFM 2009 study, yeah, which was randomized patients to either receive RVD for eight cycles with a year of LEN maintenance and then uh, were observed or uh, had a, a transplant sandwiched between a total of five cycles of RVD with LEN maintenance for a year. If you look at the eight-year progression-free survival, so yeah. PFS1, okay, yeah. it's 35% for those who got an upfront transplant, yeah. 
versus 23% for those. Sure. That was just reported to that. So 23% if you did not get an upfront transplant. Now, if you look at the overall survival between the two arms, there's it's no the difference. It's the same, 87% or something at eight years, right? Uh, at like eight that. years, it's, it's I think 61 and 62%, oh, okay. and it was 80 something, low 80% um, at four years. Yeah, but, the original publication, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so there's, yeah, that's probably the numbers you had. So yeah. the, you know, there's no difference in OS between these two, um, these two arms, but, I would argue when I have the patient in front of me, I'm making the argument why to do a transplant in the front line because you're going to increase the chances of possibly reaching that operational cure. And I don't know who those people are gonna be. It's not the majority of patients, granted. And it's probably gonna even, even be fewer patients who are high risk. But still, I would rather give them that, ch that chance in the front line. So if we're talking about later lines, it's unlikely that those patients are going to achieve a cure, right? Those are the, those are the one-offs, those are the, the anomalies. I but, guess by, by cure, you're meaning like a good treatment-free duration, a good treatment-free treatment -free duration. duration. Yeah. Well, look, okay. I have said these people were off treatment for six years. Yeah. I would, would you say, would you, I, I would call that a cure. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I, I guess I would say, I guess I would say, I mean, I mean, I guess I would say that I, I agree what you're talking about sounds lovely. I'll give you that. Uh, I guess I would say like, what do I consider cure? I guess, uh, you know, I'm a stickler for this Easton Russell 63 definition, which is like, you take those people age sex match controls and you show their uh, life expectancy is the same, which I suspect is, is still not quite there yet. But, um, but, but, but your point is well taken. That's a good place to be. I, I have a few people um, who got there through different means, not always the same means that you described um who you know they've they've finished uh maintenance two years and you know they look terrific and you keep following year after year and uh nothing has happening and so you're like fingers crossed everything is great okay let's ask them you got mrd and you find out that they have absence of that's how you define your absence of disease just that's saying. true. I guess I'd say okay. I guess I'd say that uh, some of these people existed in an era before MRD testing, and so you're just like you don't see it, you don't see it, and their life is good. Uh, okay, now let's do the let's do the uh, maintenance question. So Raj, um, you've got uh, your maintenance options. Um, uh, you know, um, and uh, and uh, before we do this, I just want to tell you that I'm going to be launching a new randomized trial. You know, I've heard I've talked to so many myeloma experts. My randomized trial is going to be this: we take healthy people, Dara KRD. Uh, time to MGUS, primary endpoint, time to MGUS. How do you think? You want to <laughs> accrue out my... No, no, no. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's talk about maintenance. So here, let's say you got the patient through um, auto. Uh, they're high risk or they're not high risk. Um, are you a PI man? Are you an IMID man? Are you a both? Uh, you know, how do you think about it? So we'll go with you, Raj, to kick it off. Yeah. So um, for high risk, you know, for, for standard risk patients, I use, you know, IMID only maintenance, just like lead maintenance, just like uh, most of the randomized trials are. Uh, for high risk patients, I think, you know, I, I recommend using dual maintenance, PI plus emit maintenance. I'll give you the rationale as to why. Yeah, I got you. So, yeah. So I think, you know, the one most important reason. So if you look at the numbers, you know, the, survival, the two year PFS with uh, emit only maintenance in high risk patients and not only in real world data, but also in the current clinical trials, it's around, you know, 50%, two year PFS. So 50% of these high risk patients will typically progress on image only maintenance at two years. And if you look at the Forte trial, you know, which is the, I think the only randomized trial comparing PI plus image versus image alone, the two year PFS of high risk patients is more than 75%. So I think that degree of PFS improvement from 50% to 75% at two years, especially for high risk patients, is I think good enough for me to change practice. Now I don't always use KR, I use mostly VR. Uh, I've been using some KR now, but mostly I use Velcade and Revlimid. Uh, if you look at the Emory data, you know, they had really good, uh, that was yeah. real world data. And they had a median PFS of around three and a half years. And that's from diagnosis, not from post transplant. Correct, correct. Right. So, so, so that's my rationale for using dual maintenance. And the okay. second thing regarding toxicity is uh, just quickly that, you know, I don't think the toxicity has increased. The treatment discontinuation rate was similar in the KR versus R maintenance arm. And even with Velcade, I don't think we see new neuropathy during the maintenance. It's mostly in the first three to six months. Fair point, fair point. And then uh, um, just to remind me, if you looked at MSMART guidelines, they still recommend uh, Velcade only for those people, don't they? Yeah, they do, right? Okay. Uh, let's go to you, Sam. Uh, uh, evolved, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't mean, it's, I think maybe Raj and I just have similar philosophies, but yeah. I, 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 have the, the, uh, I have a very similar approach. So okay. patients with high-risk myeloma, I opt for dual maintenance. I will say that I, I, for patients with high-risk myeloma, I usually do start with KRD induction. And so I, 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 I end up using KR maintenance um, afterwards quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I guess uh, this was like a sort of dogma where I trained is that if you have a choice between agents with irreversible and reversible 
toxicities always that go reversible. Um, always go reversible. If you can. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I guess I don't want to <clears> take that, that you could take that logically and it could take you to a bunch of questions I don't want to address. But um, I mean, the one caveat is uh, comparing across trials, of course, the control arm on Forte had a 66% three-year PFS, which is quite a bit better than most LEN maintenance monotherapy trials. So the 75% may not be a reasonable expectation for the patients, but it still seems to me, again, pretty likely that that's uh, going to result in a meaningful improvement in the long-term outcomes. Okay. How about you, Ben? seems like you're, you're, you're similar. What do you think? Yeah. And I, I Look, I'm totally biased. I, here at UChicago, uh, you know, we did a non-randomized phase two study of KRD for four cycles for all comers, newly diagnosed transplant, and then actually 14 cycles of, of fixed duration of KRD. Um, it does go to um, once every two weeks um, after the, the eighth cycle. And we found in our high-risk subgroup, and granted, these are small numbers, but you know, um, I'm seeing these patients. So I'm obviously um, heavily influenced by, by these experiences. Right. And our five-year PFS, which we reported was 57% in high-risk patients. Our five-year OS was 72%. You know, those are impressive in a historical context. You look at the Emory data, which is again, not um, protocolized. It was, um, you know, uh, uh, homogeneously treated patients, but um, that's, uh, you know, Joseph, I think, and RVD, uh, RVD a thousand is what you're talking about. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. Joseph, published in JCO yeah. last year, JCO last they had 107 year. patients that they treated uniformly with VRD for up to three years and found, I think Raj mentioned a three and a half year yes. PFS or so. Um, and then you have the randomized phase two data that everyone's mentioned now with the Forte trial, which did show, I don't know if anyone mentioned it specifically, but you know, a PFS advantage for KO over R. And if you look at the subgroup analysis, um, well, I don't know, but the abstract, uh, the ASCO abstracts, there's an oral for uh, this um, where they're looking at KR versus R maintenance and high-risk myeloma. I'm assuming it's going to be a positive study. Right. Uh, it's going to, it's going to show a signal for a PFS advantage. So, you know, I think we all deal with uncertainty differently, but my approach is really to err on not under-treating patients because we know that what we classically all consider to be high risk, even if there's a difference in certain sure. beliefs, whatever we all consider to be high risk, we know that some of those people are actually not going to behave like a high risk patient. Course, we're yes, going to have over-treated those patients. Right. There's going to be patients that we're going to under-treat. And so my preference is not to, 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 to under-treat as few patients as possible. And the last thing I just want to mention, we pretend like there's no opportunity to change course or dose reduce or discontinue for toxicity. I mean, that's, that's not true, right? That's I mean, a good it's point. Not, that's a good point. It's not Why? like a patient, so can, I, I tell every patient. You can always like, drop the PI if you need to. Exactly. So, yeah. okay. can, I just, can I just say one yes. comment? Yes. It's very humbling to me as an American uh, clinician and clinical researcher that the Europeans are doing so much better clinical trials than we do here. Like we're all citing for it, you know, it, know. it brings out my internationalist, if you will. Well, let's not, and, and let's dare not say recovery because they crushed us. Uh, let's go to it you, Mani. There. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, let's go to you, Mani. Uh, this is in the new season four. There's no more COVID. COVID's over. Season four. We're herd immunity on COVID season four. Mani, let's go to you. You're also, think, th you're with them. You're with them all on this, huh? I'm surprised. I'm, I'm surprised to hear this. Yeah. The end result is with them, but I will. So I'll, let me give you a little bit of a, a background. So like why, so, his, so even before Forte trial, mm -hmm. why did we rely on PIs for maintenance for high risk? Like what is the, what is the history? Hold on. Hold on. Very old study. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. I was about to, about to go in there. So that's so from very old data, we knew that thal maintenance, thalidomide maintenance for high risk patients was actually detrimental. Like it did not lead to a PFS advantage and led to a worse OS advantage. Then we had further European studies which compared thalidomide versus bortezomib um, in, in in induction and in maintenance. And yes, you know there was a you know the, so the effect for 414, like, you know, the negative prognostic factor was over for 414 was overcome and outcomes were far better with thalid with bortezomib based maintenance compared to thalidomide based maintenance. So that's where it was based on European data, not contemporary data, not compared against lenalidomide, where, you know, the role for bortezomib in high risk myeloma maintenance was sort of um, came from yeah. fortified exactly, yeah. and then we had the Emory experience, which you know even before Emory thousand was published, when all we had was a forty patient uh, paper that was published in Leukemia in 2014. M Smart had already changed. <laughs> my institution, my our institution was using it as forty patients, yeah. and uh, yeah. the outcomes were great, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, historically, you know, like 
like 32 month PFS for like those 40 patients with continuous RVD maintenance. So, so yes, we had several lines of evidence before 40, several lines of weak evidence, which we were using for, for, for maintenance in that situation. And then if you look at the large lenalidomide maintenance trials, um, and if you, if you look at the subset analysis, so in a, in, a, in a decent proportion of them, information on cytogenetic status was missing, all right? And when it was reported, the outcomes, there, there was still a benefit, but it was much less. And that's true across all of myeloma. If you do a meta-analysis, then if you look at high-risk patients, the, whatever intervention you're testing has less of a benefit. So what I tell my patients is, and, 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 and so, I, so this, that's the historical perspective and then the fourth trial. And I tell them that, you know, the evidence isn't very compelling. It is weak evidence, but I do think that I would be able to delay your progression um, if, I, if I use more than just uh, lenalidomide by itself. But I, I can't say that it necessarily impacts the overall trajectory of your disease. I can't say that, you know, adding that, disease, that newer agent later would make a difference. But I do recognize that, you know, your disease coming back is going to be a big factor. It's going to mess up your quality of life. It's going to, it's going to you know, we want to, because like the it's first- It's a buzzkill. Yes, exactly. it's the not pleasant, thing. right? And I agree with, you know, with, with Ben, with what Ben said philosophically, that the only people you cure traditionally are the ones you cure up front. And you the mean, best uh, uh, treatment free, the law, a good treatment free break, a good exactly. treatment free break. Yeah. So <laughs> the only cure you get are up front. So okay. Yes, okay. The okay. end result might be the same, yeah. but I, I acknowledge that it comes from strands of pretty weak evidence. And, and we don't know whether, you know, down the road things are, uh, it's whether it's going to be any different by adding, you know, contemporary treatments and they get access to bites and car T's and all of those things. I don't know. Yes, if yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to, let's go to Kevin. I want, yeah. Kevin, uh, you're going to, are you, what are you going to defend Kevin? He, you're going to defend. Yeah. What do you defend? Well, um, you know, my, my big claim to fame in myeloma was a paper showing you could retreat with Velcade and still get a response, but this was written probably at a time where we were still, watching patients and not treating them indefinitely. Okay. Um, so that's maybe anachronistic. <clears throat> and then uh, this came up somewhere else and I was trying to figure out what the evidence was behind revelative, revelative maintenance. It's not even rev Belgate maintenance. And yeah. so I pulled up the Two trials. Two years. I guess we have meta-analysis yeah. now, but yeah, go yeah. on. Yeah. Well, there's a meta-analysis which is largely based on the McCarthy study and the McCarthy study right. was not powered to look at overall survival. So to me, it was kind of a hypothesis they generated and published very nice in New England Journal of Medicine. But I don't know from that that I would say, gee, it improves overall survival. And then there was the, the myeloma 11 trial, which did not have an overall survival that came after that in 2019. So putting those together, I'm thinking it doesn't improve overall survival, Revlimid maintenance. Um, you're pushing, but, you're the hard, you're a hard man. You're well, hard. Okay. But, but it's, this is good for debate. Um, and, and let's say, let's say Kevin is pushing this hard. I mean, I, I actually, uh, uh, I don't, I'm not even as far as Kevin on this. Uh, cause I, I do like Revlimid uh, and I, I certainly, uh, and I think it has an OS benefit, but I mean, I think he's making an interesting argument. What if one were to argue that to your point, Monty, uh, that the trials that establish Len as a maintenance, uh, they didn't have good uh, a subsequent retreatment oh, on the control. I was going to ask you, not Heidi. I was like, oh. when do you think? Okay, you're back. Can I say though? This that is what this is what happens when you let Link slip, Kevin. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I have two star residents who uh, are going to no, be no, no. Good, good. We we One like an audience. Yeah. Year. yeah. Um, decisions out of my hands because I don't do transplants. So if I send a patient for a transplant, sure, they're going to get it. They're will, gonna get will, it. Yeah, they're yeah, gonna whatever get they it. say is the maintenance they're going to be on. So just to push, just to, to push, yeah, yeah. go back a little bit on that. So you, um, Kevin's technically correct that there is one randomized trial that, that has drives an overall survival advantage. Myeloma 11, the upper bound on the hazard ratio for overall survival is 1.05, which is uh, pretty, pretty close. Uh, and that's included in the meta-analysis. So yeah, 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 again, yeah. I think, I think I, I, we think about these things probabilistically, and I think the probability with that yeah. result and the CALGB study that he mentions and the meta-analysis is robust to other trials that had negative findings. I think, and you know, the, the data on PFS, which we could say is a surrogate endpoint that's of, you know, debatable in the context of this meeting utility, um, the, the PFS difference between lenalidomide and placebo is not subtle. No, uh, and the McCarthy uh, uh, meta-analysis sits 30 months. So yeah. like, what's the probability that an intervention that has a consistent multiple year long PFS advantage 
um, across a number of randomized trials, an OS advantage in one of those, and very nearly significant overall survival advantage in another. Um, and I forget exactly which, but I think one of the ones that showed a PFS but no OS advantage involved uh, crossover. Uh, this is one of the problems with being a millennial is we weren't around for these studies. And so we have to inherit some information. <laughs> from our I like that. Right. Yeah. But uh -huh. I think the probability that that intervention prolongs overall. Okay. I, I, I give it to you. I, I, I'm, I'm sold problem. it prolongs OS for, for the reasons aforementioned and a few more, but uh, okay. I want to end with, you know, we've only got like five minutes left. I want to yeah. end with one thought experiment. Here's a thought experiment. And, um, and uh, it'll, 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 it'll come in between you all a little bit. I mean, I guess, um, you know, I, I think at least three of you are, are kind of closely aligned and I think Monty is in, Monty's a little bit different. And then, I mean, if, if one were to have like the Supreme court justices and ideological views, uh, you know, I mean, there's there's a range here. I think there's a range. I think Kevin is he's he's coming in even he's he's coming in uh, uh, Clarence Thomas to my Scalia. I mean, he's over. He's uh, he's uh, he's outflanked me even there. I didn't think I could get outflanked on that side. Okay, so um, okay, so this is fun. Um, here's my here's my philosophical question. Okay, okay, and I guess uh, to some degree, we don't know the answer, but um, you know, so many good reasons I think that you guys have articulated why you know, you believe that the deeper response upfront and more drugs upfront is going to likely confer long-term benefits. Um, one can imagine like just this hypothetical world where we were able to, and of course it doesn't exist and I don't even know if it'd be, people would want to do it, but let's say we do a, uh, you know, 1,000, 1,000 person randomized control trial. Okay, and in one arm of this study, you know, we give people, uh, and we only pick the high-risk myeloma patients, okay? Um, and uh, we, in one arm of the study, we do DARA krd we take a certain frat, we take, you know, uh, there'll be of course some early progression and things that we can't control, but most of those people are gonna take to transplant. And then we're gonna do, um, you know, uh, PI and imid maintenance. And then eventually some of those people are gonna relapse. And uh, we're going to do the very best things you would do in your care. Um, maybe that's gonna be ELO, palm dex for some, maybe it'll be, uh, you know, uh, DARA, Kyprolis, uh, you know, I don't know, actually you've already given those two, so maybe you want to switch it up a little bit, um, but you each can decide whatever you want to do in subsequent lines of therapy. You give them belantamab, you give them Ida cell, um, you know, you maybe even save some cells, you got extra cells, and so you, you know, you give them, you put, you put cells back in them a couple of years down the load, uh, road, that's one arm of the study exactly what you all articulate. Uh, on the other arm of this study, let's say, this is called Mani Light, uh, okay? So, okay, I call it Mani Light. Let's say we do VRD, uh, you know, in almost everyone up front. We take people to transplant. It's probably gonna be maybe a few people less than, you know, you're all armed because uh, maybe you, there'll be some people on the cusp that that they think are, you know, maybe uh, a little too much disease to take to transplant, or maybe it'll be quite close. I, I actually don't know. Um, uh, and, and then we give them, uh, it's Mani Light. So instead of the PI revolution, Revlimid maintenance. We just give them Revlimid maintenance. Um, maybe they do recur a little bit sooner. But in Monty Light world, you got a lot of drugs you've never touched. They've never seen Dara. Um, you know, they've never seen Carfilzomib. You give those drugs. Who knows what the PFS is? You know, and then and then you and then you give them Belantamab, and then you give them Idacel, and then you know do another auto, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I guess what I'm wondering is hypothetically. Um, I guess you all believe, I mean, I think that, I think the articulation is you believe your arm is going to win. You're going to win an OS. Like you just think, you just think you weren't going to win the OS. I guess, hypothetically, what if the OS is the same? <laughs> I, I guess maybe that, maybe, maybe that's not even a fair question. I guess, I guess I'm trying to articulate, or maybe do you, it could, is it possible the OS is the same? And is it possible that the quality of life, if you measure, if these people have to do surveys every week for their whole lives, like rat, we don't truncate it when they finish first line therapy. Um, I guess my hypothesis is maybe uh, like in your guys' arm on second and third line therapies, the PFS will come a little faster than in Monty's arm because the drugs have never, they never touched these drugs. He might get longer PFSs. So he might gain some quality of life on the back end in his strategy. Um, so I guess I just, just as a thought experiment, do you think, I don't know, any, any plausibility to this? Is it yeah. still, yeah, okay. That's plausible. That's a risk I think we all acknowledge that we're running. I mean, Benji made the point that we are over treating some patients and we don't know who they are. So um, that's, I think that's a risk we all have to counterbalance with the risk that we undertreat people and don't achieve long remissions and, and that, that has its own problems. So I, I fully, I, it, would not, it would not shock me if such a trial was If negative. such a trial were to, okay. I don't, I don't lose, yeah, but I don't lose sleep over this okay. concept okay. of saving drugs for later. I, I, don't, I don't get this. I mean, we don't do this in any, maybe you can enlighten me. Do we do I'll this give you some examples. Other? Okay, yeah, yeah, go on. <laughs> Here, here's, I mean, where, here's, where, here's where I think we do it. Uh, okay, 
I guess I would say there, you're, you're right in the sense that in 2020, it is, uh, I think, almost unheard of, uh, and, and people are moving away from it. But there's some historical examples. I'll give you a couple, to my knowledge. One, um, you know, originally in small cell lung cancer, there was a great deal of debate about whether we do four or six cycles of treatment. Um, uh, and, uh, and we went with four because of randomized trials that show, even though there's a PFS or a time to treatment failure increased, um, there is no OS benefit. There's a famous paper, I think, by George Sledge in breast cancer, where he combined anthracycline taxane versus taxane, then anthracycline or anthracycline, then taxane. And actually the combo up front, you get better uh, PFS and deeper responses, but you didn't get the OS on the back end. And the discussion of that like 92 JCO paper was do them in sequence. Um, but, you know, but, and then maybe the other example is like the, another live debate is in metastatic melanoma, where there's this huge debate about Nevo then Ipi or Nevo and Ipi. And of course you pay the price up front with um, your hypophysitis. Um, uh, but but your point is well taken that um, and maybe the other the other place is um, I don't know I guess uh, you know we used to do isn't there a randomized trial in DLBCL and frontline of auto and like that fail like so like um, uh, you know so we reserve the auto for relapse refractory and you have to reinduce them not for everyone in CR one um, I, I don't well, know let if me take your, no, let me take your example of a checkpoint inhibitor yes. for instance yes. where you know you have a tail at the end of these. Right. And, and I'm, I'm making this argument that we are seeing a tail in myeloma. Maybe it's a lot lower than, you know, in melanoma, where you're using, you know, you sound uh, like Barlow. <laughs> okay. Well, I see. I well, see. right. I mean, you know, they've made that point with total therapy trials all the time <laughs> that there was, but I'm not advocating giving the right. base over and over to patients. Right. Obviously that I like it sometimes, though. Yeah. but a lot of people say, well, we're, we're just basically coming back to what he came up with, which is VD pace, but we use our novel agents. Uh, yeah, that's true. I think we now have tools at our disposal to try to limit treatment exposure. Um, not to keep banging this drum, but again, you know, we have MRD. It's a tool at our disposal. It's ripe for something like this for trials. You know, we have the master trial. Um, you know, at ESCO, we're reporting on ELO KRD where we're actually using um, MRD guided um, trials. And that's going to help inform how do we de escalate? How do we get patients off of therapy? How do we define these? Um, durable long-term re responses. I'll, I'll use that term. Okay. Instead okay. Of sure. Okay. Well, I, uh, I, 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 also. Okay. Well, I guess uh, our, our time is up. I'm going to give you each, uh, you get the last 30. So I, so I guess I'll summarize and then you give you all the 30 seconds. You get your closing statement. I guess I would say this is a lot of fun, a lot of fun, gentlemen. I really appreciate you doing this. And I'll tell you why it's fun for me. Um, because I think it is nice to kind of see the range of views. I now feel like I, 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 I know who I should have brought in or I wish joined this call who didn't show up because they would have, I think they would have pushed in different places. Um, uh, uh, but, the, you know, that's, that's healthy. And I think, um, you know, your arguments are, are good and compelling. And I think, um, I mean, if I were to be honest, I think that the field of myeloma docs is probably, you know, they're closer to, uh, I, I think you're, you're all side of the spectrum than they are to Monty or Monty Light, which is where I fall, uh, or Kevin who flanks me. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we have to admit, I mean, I think where the field is closer to where they are. Um, uh, although, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're good arguments we made on the other side. Um, uh, I guess um, we will have to someday revisit this and have the debates on MRD. Who do you test? When do you test? How do you test? Is it, cons you know, what are the, what, what do you measure? Are, uh, do you like VDJ? Uh, do you like flow? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and maybe we should do it again. Um, uh, but I guess closing thoughts on this question of, um, I guess the things we talked about here, initial treatment, um, maintenance, um, uh, and, and I think Ben put it nicely and Sam put it nicely that, you know, we're at the end of the day, we're all talking about uncertainty and how do you, how do you make sense of uncertainty in oncology, um, knowing that you know we're, we're guiding the ship between the rock and the shore of overtreatment, undertreatment, um, and and you know and and not, and to be honest, none of us know the right answer here because that gold standard definitive trial has never been done. So you know, we, to some degree, it's it's the fun of it's the fun of the field. Uh, so let's, let's start with you, Raj. We'll go in the the order and we'll get you know uh, cl close it out. So what are your thoughts? La last thoughts. Yeah, so yeah, it was really fun. So I, I think when I have, you know, a newly diagnosed myeloma patient sitting in front of me, I think it's it's mainly about risk and benefit. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, it was brought up that why I don't use data VRD, for example, in standard risk. So when I have, when the evidence is, you know, not as robust at that, then I usually, you know, look at risk and benefit because I know that the high-risk patients are not going to do well with the current approach and I'm willing to take more risk in those patients. And uh, regarding maintenance, though, I must say that, you know, in the Forte trial is one of the, I think, to my knowledge, one of the only trials where with the KR versus our maintenance, the absolute benefit in PFS is more in high risk compared to standard risk. If you look at the K-plan mild curves, mm -hmm. they were more, much more widely separated. You mean the absolute numerical? 
Yes, yes. And yeah. hazard ratio too? I don't no, know about no. that. I don't think that. No, okay. not the hazard ratio. They're pretty, they're pretty similar, but okay. that's, to, but to Manny's point, the expectation is the hazard ratio is going to be yes. higher and high risk. So that's, yes. that's a meaningful, if it's durable, a meaningful achievement. Yeah. So that's kind of, you know, I think we have very compelling data now to use dual maintenance because we are using PFS in, for example, using data, Velcade decks and first relapse, right? So I think the same, uh, although maintenance, you know, in myeloma, I, I see maintenance as more of a continuous therapy than an adjuvant therapy in somebody who is cured. You know, I think it's different. So I think if you're using PFS in that situation, why okay. won't you? That's a, that's, a, that's a fair and elegant point. Uh, Sam? Yeah, I think, um, I guess I'll close on a philosophical note. I think, um, you know, there's an interesting range of views on this. And uh, I, I was raised in the Jewish tradition and Benji, ben, Ben's more serious about this than me, but the t there's a, a quote from the Talmud that's along the lines of, if two people don't agree, they're probably both right. <laughs> and uh, I think we all can acknowledge that there are risks of type one and type two error with, you know, under treating and over treating respectively. I think uh, it's just important to keep your finger on the pulse and, you know, in incorporate the data into your own philosophy and, and advocate the best for your patient that you can. Well put. Beautiful quote. Ben? I, I mean, I, I said something along these lines on, on Twitter, but for those, I'm sure there are many listening that aren't convinced, right, to use dual maintenance or whatever you want to call it, PI, IMID, post-transplant therapy. But I mean, you know, because there's no proven OS benefit. Just think about this. In the SWOG study, S0777, VRD versus RD, wasn't, wouldn't really robustly look at high-risk myeloma, but there was no, you know, statistically significant benefit for VRD. In the IFM 2009 in, in study, the high risk subset, you mean? For in the high risk okay, subset. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah in I, and same for DARA RD versus RD in the Maya trial in the high risk subset. In IFM 2009, there wasn't a PFS benefit for frontline transplant in high risk myeloma. Len, len maintenance, you mentioned. So, what are you left with? Are you just going to treat high risk patients with RD and say, see you later? <laughs> I mean, it's obviously an inflammatory, you know, it's meant to be a little bit inflammatory. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. My point is to say, you know, we, we, if we religiously follow, you know, wait for these OS uh, yeah. endings that may not even really be powered to show these differences, we're never, we're never going to figure it out. So it's yeah. again, all about how you deal with this um, uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, your point is well taken. I guess, I mean, I would say just as a, like a, a rule of thumb is like, you know, if a, if a trial has a subgroup that was not powered for the endpoint, but the overall trial has that endpoint, the only reason I would even start to think differently about that subgroup is if the hazard ratio was so dissimilar from the overall hazard ratio and that there's like an interaction coefficient that was significant. But your point is well taken. You're never going to get OS in all the subgroups. Monty, closing thoughts here. You're headed to Utah. You're practically an attending and then I'll say one thing about attending life. Yeah. Right. So, you know, there's this one thing that I've learned on this, this one project that you and I did together is that, you know, when, when you account for post-protocol therapies, and if you look at myeloma trials, and if you look at trials where post-protocol therapy was reported and where access to post-protocol therapies was given, generally, you know, the OS benefit that you saw tended to either like diminish or, or, or diminish. And the counterpoint is in trials where you've already seen an OS benefit, it's generally been driven by a lack of access to post-protocol therapies. And that is common with all the, so we don't have, you know, for data to map up front, we don't have OS benefit yet for some of the trials, but we do have for, let's say, Alcyon and what, like 10% of patients in the control arm got it. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to see similar findings with Cassiopeia, we're, we're going to see similar findings with Maya. We, we know that already it's probably going to happen. So it, it doesn't answer the question of, you know, see, early versus later. Yeah, sure. And I think that as a field, and I'm, and I'm learning this myself, as, and it's not just myeloma, as a field, we're very myopic in terms of how we look at post-protocol therapies and sequencing, because the landscape of our trials is just built that way that, you know, we look at this one intervention and then we just like, you know, after that, we're done. The, the study is over. We don't look at what happens afterwards. And hence, questions on sequencing and, you know, long-term, you know, ideal strategy on how to manage these patients remain unanswered. So, so those are, are my well, well, great philosophical point. Uh, Kevin, as the, as the senior physician, as the chairman, uh, uh, closing thoughts, sir. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's really great for me <clears throat> to understand how experts in myeloma interpret these trials, because as a generalist, you know, we see myeloma and the next patient has prostate and the next patient sure. has breast. 
And it takes a lot of time to read the clinical trials closely and figure out what the right thing to do is. And I struggle myself with how to interpret some of the things inference about prognostic versus predictive factors and what MRD means. And, and in myeloma, certainly like the number of trials has just escalated over the past decade where it used to be kind of simple when it was 2000 and now in 2021, it's very complicated. So I, I'm really appreciative um, listening to how everybody interprets these trials and I've learned a lot from that. And I also appreciate on Twitter when people will discuss trials back and forth. That's actually a really easy way for me to sort of understand what's going on. That's so, well said, thanks. yeah. Thanks for that. Okay, well, thank you all for doing this. I guess my parting thought to you all was I wanted to say about assistant professorship. I guess I would say that, um, you know, I think like when you come out of fellowship the first few years, like uh, uh, like I feel like um, you're, you're at the top of your game when it comes to like the ability to recall the, the all the trial names at the tip of your finger is like, uh, I think it like, it's only going to go down. No, no, maybe it gets better if you really just, just keep your uh, uh, sights on myeloma, but it's really good. And I feel like um, uh, the first two years of practice is like the most interesting time to me in the sense that I, I, I think you, you know the right answer. Like it's not that you don't know. I mean, you know what you want to do, but there is something to me. To in my, I mean, I feel like um, when you go from being the person who always bounces it by one other person to just being in the seat and being the point person, and it's not about that you don't know. You do know, and like if you told it the the other quote of the older attending, they'd say, "Yeah, of course, that you got it. You're, that's exactly what I would do too." Um, but it's that you don't feel on the inside like like you feel a little nervous about it. Like, oh, maybe, but who am I going to run this by? And I think it takes like two years for that feeling to subside. I'm not sure that's good, but I just think it's the reality of it. After two years, that feeling will subside. And then you will feel, I think, uh, you'll feel like you know what you have always known along. So uh, uh, what you've known all along. So on that, on that positive note, I want to thank you all for doing this. A lot of fun. Round table, different positions, articulated masterfully. We'll, we'll do it again with more um, myeloma topics. And I guess I like to say that, um, you know, um, a field isn't doing, it, you know, uh, all great fields of medicine have uh, ongoing debates. And the things we didn't debate uh, are the things that, you know, uh, there's so many things that we didn't talk about that we just all agree on uh, because that's where the evidence is rock solid. So thank you all for doing this. Real pleasure. We'll post it soon. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. It's great. Yeah. Thanks.